we'll start sharing a little bit and then uh all right i'm going to post this live in entourage right now so it should be going all right we are Give live it yeah so if you want you can jump on my wall and share it okay that's live there we go we can share this i am here. i'm going to go over to your wall brian and everybody else tuning in yeah go to your walls and share it out too <laughs> share share that helps us sharing out. is caring is that uh, so is that how, how do works? i go to your wall brian just, just go to my facebook and then uh you can share it from my wall to your wall there you go all right well we're getting that uh that going if you guys are just tuning in throw us a thumbs up uh let us know you're out there and as always we're live so uh tonight's guest joe if you've got any questions for him uh after brian introduces him uh, just post them up in the comments so give us just a couple more seconds to uh finish sharing and we will get started all right we got it over here now let's see where else can we share it to yeah there's dawn saying hello already hi huh? Dawn. All right, let me get going here. You got an entourage, I'm going to dump it in entrepreneurs too. All yes, right. we are streaming, we are streaming live in entourage. All right, now we are streaming live in entrepreneurs. And All right. um, that's it, that's enough people that they don't see it now. They ain't going to see it. All right. So who do we have on the show tonight, Brian? All right, all right, here we go. So we have the one and only Joe Sonona. Um, Joe goes, me and Joe go back about, just about five years now. I walked into a class at Hofstra University, and Joe was the professor to teach me the real estate class. And I was a shot, hot shot punk that uh, thought I was just going to learn the real estate class from, uh, just to, so I could flip house and get an inside track. And uh, Joe talked to me for a couple minutes, and he was like, you're going to sell. I was like, no, 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 I don't want to work weekends. I just want to get flip houses and get an inside deal. And here we are just about five years later with a team and selling $30 this year. And uh, it's been a busy year. So Joe was right. And then Joe on his own, um, Joe has Sonona Speaks seminars. So he does uh, public speaking and uh, all kinds of life coaching and real estate coaching. And uh, um, he's part of LIBOR and coaching for that and training for that. He's he's uh, got all kinds of tags under his name of all kinds of... Uh, of uh affiliations and uh, certifications that he's got and uh he's been doing about 30 years now joe selling real estate 33, 33 years so he's I'm an amateur so he's an amateur just getting started in the business <laughs> and uh and joe uh yeah he's all around good good guy he's my sponsor at exp uh sam also part of exp realty and mm -hmm. uh when we made the move to exp uh we kind of jumped ship together and joe joined and i joined shortly behind him and uh now it's kind of cool because uh, we went from uh, he went from teaching me the business. Now we're our partners in the business, so it's a uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, and we have my weekly meetings with uh, my team, and Joe jumps in there and helps us, uh, gives us some fire, and gives us some Thursday fire. And it's all good stuff. So Joe, tell us what I missed. I know there's a whole load there. Well, it's I'm, <clears throat> I'm gonna correct you for a second. Um, I, I got all choked up. See, Brian talks and I get choked That's up. That's it. Um, so uh, some corrections, I uh, used to be a vice president for the Long Island Board of Realtors in Nassau County. And I did about 25 years of service as a director, as an all around uh, committee chair uh, of several committees. And then uh, I took an early retirement or a late retirement, however way you wanna um, phrase it from volunteer service with the Long Island Board, the New York State Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Realtors. Just a little pause, just to reflect on my business, to uh, get more involved in the EXP uh, model, just to uh, dive deep into what we are doing here as a business. Uh, Brian and I uh, went into partnership uh, like he said, of almost three years ago. Yeah, about three years and, ago. Uh, yeah, about three years ago. We, uh, April, it will be three years for me. I think you came in a month after. So it'll be three years, May of 2022. 
And, um, you know, the ride has been really, really smooth and uh, a couple of transition periods for both of us. But um, overall, whole new world, are, right? <laughs> it's, it seems like a lifetime ago already yeah, that yeah. we <laughs> were on this uh, journey. And uh, neither one of us knew what we were getting ourselves into until um, we uh, actually dove deep into the business. Uh, and the income stream has uh, doubled, yeah. I believe, our income uh, I've being been, here. I've been doubling every year since, uh, since I joined the yeah. industry. Yeah. And, and I'm very proud of this little statuette that I got last year for hitting Icon. Yes. yes. Uh, this is uh, what they give you above uh your cap of sixteen thousand dollars so you hit an icon level uh past 20 more transactions and they give you a statuette of this but this means something to me this means sixteen thousand dollars worth of stock shares so i'm very extremely proud of this uh yeah, statue that, where yeah. you know i got the uh other awards in my lifetime uh and they did mean something for a time period but um, they fade away. This doesn't fade away. I see it every this year. Is, Everyone gets their, their phony awards, done. you know. Oh, top agent right? in the <laughs> office, top sales of this, top sales of that. And all it is is a certificate. And in our world, it actually means stock, which is kind of cool. Which, you know, companies are, you know, I'm going to be a gentleman tonight and, uh, and every night after uh, this one. And I'm always going to say that brokers, managers, they give their certificates of recognition, their trophies. And for a period of there, uh, or a time period, it means something to the agent. But what it means to me to have that is to be a stock owner, a uh, stockholder in the company. I feel like I own part of EXP because of my stock. And uh, I know you feel the same way, right, yeah, I got, Brian? I don't know. I think last time I looked, 100000 or so in company stock. I mean, in two years, that's pretty incredible. I wouldn't have that anywhere else. So that's mm -hmm. hitting all those bonuses and hitting all those targets and all the stuff that we do. It's uh, it's kind of cool. Definitely be uh, when you own the company, you care about it more. Sam, you you opted into the uh, stock. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in that too. I've it's, got I've got several thousand dollars vesting. My yeah. audio's messing up. Yeah, there's a comment here from Kayla that uh, she couldn't it's hear like you echoing. in an entourage. You can hear an echo. Yeah. I restarted it in Entourage, but I'm getting a bad echo. Give me a minute. Okay. I got it on my Facebook. It's on the right. No, it's on my head. Yeah, it's, it's in you. Yeah, because it's on my feed. It's on my end. It's a loose nut behind the uh, keyboard right there. I think I got it. All right, try now. Yeah. Yep, fixed it. There you go. All right, so what are we talking about? Now I can hear myself, and it's not just... Whenever I talked, it was just feeding back. Oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> but I, I feel yeah. it. Fair enough. we got to hear you talk. I, you got to hear yourself talk. I want to emphasize <laughs> also that being part of this company also means that um, it redefined who I was as a real estate agent. And on the local level, uh, here I am in this company. I'm still doing local transactions uh, all over the South Shore of Long Island. My team has expanded to Nassau County, into Nassau County, into Suffolk County, into Queens, into Brooklyn. Um, this has been uh, as a result of growth. And I think it takes a lot of courage and a lot of faith to leap forward into something you don't know. And you, you have this tremendous, tremendous strength to, to step into your greatness and you just do it you know there's no all in you know, all in that was my message this morning you got to go all in you can't just put your toe in the water you got to dive in and that's what we did um, it, but it takes faith it takes yes. a lot of courage to do something like that it, it takes a lot of uh you know taking the fear out of everything to to do something and not everybody is built the same way but what we can say to ourselves is that if we don't take that leap of faith into our business, then uh, we stay, you know, in this little box, you know, I, I call it the, the, the small little box, you know, and here's you bouncing off the four walls of this box. And uh, you're constantly doing the same things year after year, making the same resolutions. 
but the resolutions don't come out of the box yep. and they don't take shape and they don't take, um, you know, a hold of, they take a hold of you rather than you taking a hold of them. Yep. And uh, that's what was going on with me. And again, none of, no knocking of the companies that I was associated with because, you know, the companies that I was associated with have all their style, all their method, all their culture. Uh, they have good people behind them, um, but they are running uh, a ship of repetition mm. year after year. And I didn't want to be in that repetitious or, or be part of the repetitious behavior. You know, and we all do it. We all go through transactional brokerage year after year. And I think EXP gave us the uh, ability to get away from the repetitious behavior and get into some new, competitive, yeah. out-of-the-box thinking, innovative, right, creative energy. Um, and and, and I, I just love it. I love it. It's redefining my career in my 33rd year. Yeah, it's um, in the apex world that uh, you're not part of yet, but soon one of these days I'm going to get you into the, our apex world. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of big heavy hitter EXP agents um, because in an entrepreneurial <laughs> world, the sky's the limit with EXP. You can go as far as you can go. And, um, you know, it's just, I was basically looking at, you know, doing my own brokerage, you know, at the same time. I was like, I didn't really see why I should be paying, uh, you know, broker and doing all the work and, being successful on my own and I was about to go down that road and then you got the overhead and all the expense of that and the liabilities and all that and then the XP shows up and basically you get to almost function as a broker without all the overhead without all the responsibility and it's really a wonderful model I mean it really allows the scaling and the growth to just keep going and that's what we try and do right we we talk about a lot as the hamster in the wheel right well we get used to this pattern of just running and running and running and not getting anywhere doing the same thing over and over and over again and you run a little bit harder and maybe you do a little bit better, but you're still not getting anywhere. When you finally hop off that wheel and do something different and break the mold and dive dive in deep to something new, that's where the opportunity comes. And, you know, that whether it's EXP or whether it's just business, life, or whatever it is in general, when we get outside of our comfort zone and we get outside of that, that hamster wheel and start, you know, breaking the mold and, and trying new things, that, that's where we grow. And uh, I think it's and so you important. Hear, you hear there are successful agents out there. You hear of their success people are crushing it killing it whatever expression you want to use but you have to ask yourselves if you're out there doing that you know running on that hamster wheel year after year doing the same transactions or the amount of transactions or even better than those coming up in 2022 does your uh business have a, a culture to it of collaboration you know that's what i oh, i've said it from day one i i'm joining a culture of collaboration i'm joining a different type of um uh, company where i'm given the opportunity to mentor someone uh, uh not someone uh, i mentor a lot of people yeah. in this company and i get paid for mentoring them and i bring them into um, uh, I show them a different experience. I give them my experience. I, I, I'm, I'm giving them my habits, so to speak. And, um, and, and then on their closings, they are paying me back, you know, a percentage for their first three deals. And I'm making them into, you know, full-fledged agents. By the time they graduate the mentorship of our company, which is only three deals, um, they go on to become what's called cappers. And, uh, and, and as cappers, they will, they will give that time and talent to someone else. And that's, you know, we're passing the baton. We're passing that, that knowledge to those people over and over again. And it's like having little mini-me's, you know, with their talents. It's, it's and, huge because we, we say, what, 85% of agents fail within the first three years, right? So if you... 87%. 87%. Right, so staggering, uh, staggering numbers. And why? Because people get in, they think it's easy, they don't get any help, and they fail miserably, mm -hmm. and then they run away. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and it's not you know, easy. we talked about that before. <laughs> so the idea that EXP makes you, if you're a new agent, you have to either join a team where you get mentorship, or you have to have a mentor. You know, for at least mm -hmm. your first three deals. And once you get three deals under your belt, you kind of at that point either you got to figure it out or you don't. 
Um, well, you, know. you can't teach somebody a work ethic, right, Sam? Yeah, exactly. No, no, not at all. Not at all. That's, uh, that's something they learn by themselves over time. You know, and, yeah. and some kids have it at 20 and some adults don't have it at 40. So yeah, it's just yeah. it's one of those things. Sam, you, yeah. you started, uh, you have a little team, right? You have a couple people going? I, know you're I do there. now, yeah. Coming on, uh, actually, first of next year. I, I had a team under Remax. And when COVID hit, I decided to leave Remax. And that's, that's when I went to EXP. And um, I didn't want the team thing. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do other stuff. Um, you know, I spend maybe 15 to 20% of my time doing real estate now. Um, it's, it's not my, it's not my full-time distraction. Um, I've still capped the last two years, um, but it's, it's not my, it's not my full-time thing. And, you know, I never took the downline building part of it seriously because it felt as though I would be trying to sell an MLM opportunity, but now I've got multiple years experience in real estate and i've got the ability to mentor people and coach them in business and in real estate i'm like yeah you know what probably should start um looking at recruiting a little more heavily and looking at team building especially i i don't have any lead systems switched on um i'm as busy as i want to be and it's it's a hundred percent organic uh just from facebook and i i've hired a couple of realtors that are gonna actually start next week as soon as the holidays are over and uh we're gonna turn on the lead funnels that i spent years building and uh, and see what all that does you know we've got a dormant youtube a dormant facebook we've got all the google stuff's already done and built out it's just there's never any point putting any money to it because you know if if I do if I do twelve or fifteen houses in a year, that keeps me plenty busy with everything else I've got going on, and I get that I get that organically just from people texting me from what they see on Facebook. So um, I'm really looking forward to turning some marketing on this uh, this next few weeks and seeing what we can get done. You know? Yeah, I just did that myself, and basically I'm pushing on four and a half years, and I've never had to really pay for leads because it was just my sphere of influence, all the people I know, and my social media and all that stuff. But right, and you're busy, and yeah, you're, and you know your, your bills are paid, and everything's it's like, good. So, um, so this year, because of the team, I said I got to start generating some more leads for the team because I take lead generation; it just comes naturally to me. Like you, we have a big sphere of influence, mm -hmm. and people just call us when they need to buy or sell a house. But right, and what I it, that took that, time though. That didn't happen overnight. Yeah, it takes time. It takes you know time. that that takes a lot of time and a lot of hard work. And um, <laughs> um, you know, but it's the easiest way to sell though. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it's the most organic way to do mm -hmm. it you know but then yeah. i realized my team doesn't have the same spirit i have and i take it for granted that my spear is huge and so they're struggling with just you know, i'm like just your spear will feed you just get it out there and it's not working for them so i said all right so your spear obviously isn't the size of my spear so we got to work on this so um we just started with the funnels and all that other stuff and generating leads well, well i think you have to i think you have to understand systems too yeah. and those systems are are like little propellers, you know, mm -hmm. you're going in one motion with good intentions. And then sometimes we run out of steam in our business because maybe the motivation's not there. Perhaps, uh, uh, you know, we, we wake up too late or we go to bed too late. Uh, we don't wake up an, uh, on time. We don't time block. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. uh, we don't read motivational uh, uh, material. We don't listen to motivational material. These are all, as I call, little elements, little potions to our success. And I think if everybody did a little bit of those a little potions that I just described, I think everybody would be successful in the business. But again, you can't teach the work ethic. Yeah. You can't. It, there's no such thing as teaching a, a work ethic. Schools have time and tried it over and over again. Real estate schools don't. They, they don't know... They don't teach the business of the business. Yes. They you know? teach rules, but they don't teach how to do it. They just. Hi, <laughs> Brian. Yes. I didn't teach you the business of the no. business. I taught you the basics yeah. and the rules governed by the Department of State. And there's the problem right there with education because we're teaching from this textbook that is only giving you the basics of the business, but they're not teaching you time blocking. They're not teaching you anything about mentorship and finding a good mentor to model yourself after, or even shadowing part of the business, you know, shadowing 
the agent that is the top producer in the office or on the team. Um, and no one has come up with this type of class to get approved by the Department of State because the Department of State only wants the basics and they don't feel that that is a, a, a plus to the consumer. See, when you write a class, right, and I've written maybe, maybe one, right, I'm not good at writing classes, I admit it, but, um, and, uh, and, and in, any, in any admittance, there is no failure, right? There's just growth from that point on. So here I am, you know, writing a class, and I'm told uh, that I have to write a class that benefits the consumer. Well, if I'm a better agent, and I have good habits, and I teach my fellow students how to adopt to those habits that make them the money that they need to survive in this world or to get out of their nine to five. It's benefiting them, but it's also benefiting the consumer because now I've made a better agent. I've mm -hmm. made more of a professional agent out there. Um, people just, right, Brian, I think there was a young lady in your class that said, I, I'm, I'm just looking to dabble in the business. Yeah. And all I did was take my imagine. Very <laughs> valid. And I was going like this in the class the first time. I'm like, we don't dabble, young lady. We yeah. do the business. We go for a swim. We don't put a toe when we dive in. That's that was Ryan's uh, message uh, the other morning. It's uh, you know, it's either you do it or you don't do it. There's there's no halfways in life. You know, if you do it halfway, right. it's you get a halfway job. You know, it's either you do it or you don't do it. Or as, I, as I teach, vanilla and chocolate. There's yeah. no other yeah. flavor in between. Yeah, it's true the vanilla or choose the chocolate but there's no flavor in between 100%. otherwise you're dealing with fear as your other choice i call it the third choice the blind choice you know people when they can't make a choice they they choose fear over the other two choices because they 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 have this too much of this conversation going on in their head you know and that little man or that little woman in their head is talking them out of the decision that they should be making in order to better their career. False I mean, evidence appearing about, real, right? That's what fear stands for. Yeah. Right? What? False evidence appearing real. Uh, exactly. That's, and that's, that's, the, that's the games that's in your head that fear. scare you that really aren't there most of the time. Yeah, that's definitely fear. Yeah, yeah. So what do you find that most agents coming into the business are lacking? Is is there any particular skill set that they can, you know, you generally see a pattern in, you can tell them to go away and work on, or do you find it just across the board, they're not quite prepared to own a business. I think there's an overwhelming, um, there, there's just an overwhelm, uh, a lot of overwhelm, a lot of over uh, kill on everything. You remember what an agent is expected to do. Uh, agents expected to uh, brand themselves. Uh, uh -huh. An agent is expected to learn uh, how to negotiate, uh -huh. uh, learn how to list people's property, learn how to rent people's property, learn how to speak. So they have to have developed social skills. Now, these, these are some of the, the majority of agents coming into our business have been doing this for probably all their life and have not had any interaction with people in general. I grew up on the streets of Brooklyn and we were out on the streets playing sports all, uh, all four seasons, right? We interacted with each other. We used our my imaginations. We create. We had creativity. And the kids today, they they sit behind. They they must have sat behind their their TVs and did this all day long with a, either a phone or a device. And there's no um, interaction. So now they come into our business with these with, expected to have all these skills. And who are they learning from? But the people that have the skills and are threatened by the new people and therefore the older people in the in, in the business don't want to mentor them because they're afraid that they're going to take away their trophy or their their spotlight. So what they do is they show them very little attention and then those agents run away or they run to a better or a better mentor who will guide them toward that result. 
But then these kids or these younger agents coming into our industry, they expect to start at the top of the ladder because nobody taught them that you have to work from the bottom and build a foundation in order to build this house of theirs. But again, that's what I'm teaching. You know, that's what I, I'm only one person doing that. Maybe, maybe I'm a handful of people doing that with, with other students that I've taught that to. And there are other instructors out there, but we're all feeling that same struggle with those agents. And we're always telling the older generation that they should be, um, you know, sharing, they should be mentoring, they should be letting people shadow. I mean, um, the other day I said that real estate is like a Supreme Court nomination. You're there till you're dead, right? You know, pretty much people do this business till they're 80, 90, and then they get sick and then they don't get to enjoy the rest of their life. I have found at this company the ability to enjoy the things that I do Maybe I don't enjoy them more often than I should, but now clearly in my purview, and I'm saying this live so that my clientele can hear it, that my colleagues can hear it in the business, but I have a, a, a picture of what retirement looks like for the first time in 33 years. Now, I'm not retiring tomorrow, so don't go around and spreading rumors, all of you, and don't tell anybody that I'm quitting the business, you, you dastardly people, you, that uh, uh, love to take my words and twist it. You're worse than the media. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not retiring now, but I have a picture of what retirement looks like. And the more I stay in the business, the more I recreate and redefine, I'm building a nice picture of my team. You talked about building a team, Sam. I'm on my third try. This is my <laughs> third shot of building a team, right? But I'm building it with systems and with know-how and with fullness of their work ethic. Now they, like this team wants to do it. Well, that's and, that was my point from earlier, um, Joe, is that the older generation don't want to share because they're scared the young generation will take their trophies. I want the kids that want to win trophies. Mm. I want them. I want to coach them. I want to surround myself with more trophies because I'm still going to win my trophies, yep. but we'll just go find other trophies for them to compete for and for them to win. I want kids that want the trophies. I want to share everything I know. Um, if I can, if I can shortcut 10 years of business suffering off of some poor kid, um, let's go, let's win him some trophies, you know? And I want everybody in my damn office to want trophies i can't oh, yeah. sit on a beach and retire uh, that's not me because i'd be bored uh, to pieces on it but i would love to just sit back and just watch the kids grow and my i have two daughters and i want them to see that you know i'm more involved in their lives uh because right now i feel like i'm not involved and that's because i'm propelling this business Mm -hmm. for that retirement. And um, I don't want to miss the important moments of their life. But at the same time, I have to worry about this part of the business. It's a, it's a little a balancing game, you know, oh, until the day I say, you know what, I'm not taking on any new clientele. I'm just going to work with my, uh, my, my referring business. I'm going to work with the clientele that I've had for the last you know, 30 something years. And I'll work just those people until I have, or I could take a portion or a piece of, of my team's business and their team's business and their team's business. And let's franchise the entire teams. And let's just build out a whole platform where not just I'm retired, or I'm taking it easy, but my team is taking it easy. Mm. You know, I think I shocked them when I told them back in November, I want to retire you all. Mm. And they looked at me and said, wait, wait, we're not ready to retire. No, no, you don't understand. It's a, not just a figure of speech, but it will be a reality that you don't have to do this business 20, 30 years in. You don't have to do it when you're old and gray. You know, that's the choice now. Uh, COVID has really taken us on a different journey. But before that journey, 
there was EXP that gave us the model to look into the future. Uh, we created the metaverse, if you will, right? Mm. We are the ones that created yeah, the metaverse. Cloud Office, right? This, this was uh, ahead of the curve, ahead of uh, COVID's curve. Yeah, I hate yeah. to tell you, Mark Zuckerberg, but you didn't create the metaverse. Fred Glenn Sanford did with his vision and his um, his insight into what a true retirement from the business could be, what it would look like. And you can't do that. You know, Sam, you touched upon it before. You know, you can't do that doing just transactional business and you know what let them call us an mlm company for all we know uh, or let them let them call us a pyramid you know we can take the pyramid right we can take the shape of the pyramid and we can point to one person called the broker Mm -hmm. and we can say that the bottom of that pyramid is feeding that one broker and that's called brokerage yeah that's why it's that's why it doesn't bother me like it just it it feels difficult to sell to me, but it, it it's the same. Let's say let's just use a round number. It's the same twenty percent that goes back to the agents, where it would be twenty percent going to a broker um, at the end of the day. And I'd rather it get split between the agents in a pyramid uh, of all things, um, because it's not an, an infinite pyramid. It does stop. I mean, you know, there's sense to it, and right. you're literally just redistributing the revenues from a company. Uh, to everybody, but isn't of just it to wonderful one that one founder, right? Because everyone says, "Oh, you're a franchise." No, no, no. We're one founder. We're publicly traded on Wall Street, and we take that same pyramid, if you will, and invert it. And now it's one person, one man, who is feeding all of us agents from revenue streams that we are getting from our sponsors and sp- people we sponsor and the money's flowing up. Yes. As an MLM, because that's what we are. You know, our part of our company is an MLM, but we're a good MLM. We're actually making money for each other. The beauty, There's that's that the beauty of culture it that I see. collaboration. The, so what's the best way to attract agents then? The best way to attract agents is simply by what you just said, attraction. I'm thinking with training packages, with yeah. free training videos, showing them how to put stuff together. Because Simply everyone's interested in their download. You know how two coach. magnets come? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Attraction. Brian is a magnet. Yeah. I'm a magnet. You're a magnet. What we put out on social media magnetizes the people and attracts them to us. Mm-hmm. Right? They want to know a little bit about what we're doing. They want to be as successful as we are. And we tell them and we show them the model and we tell them this is what you need to do in order to change your life. And some people, it scares the hell out of them. And some people are attracted to it. That's why Brian and I and yourself have the people that are in our frontline agent systems. These are people that we went into partnership with. Brian and I decided, you know, almost three years ago to go into partnership and we all, I think we were in the restaurant with Juan at that time, and we looked at each other and we said, what do we have to lose? If we lose this, we go back to our brokerages. Mm-hmm. You know, we go back to doing what we did always. You yeah. know, we do that now. We do transactional brokerage, only we're doing it at a higher level. We're higher level thinkers right now. We're, we're, we're out there in that metaverse of, of attraction and we're bringing those people on. Any me- anyone who doesn't hear this message is not a fool. They're just scared of making a change, you know. And I got to tell you guys something. I got to share something with you guys. In college, um, I, I I went to see my counselor one day, and she had the window open, you know, behind her, and some leaves blew in from the fall. You know, they were fall. It was fall time. And she says, is, and she picked them up and she goes, is, isn't this great? Knowing full well that I hated the fall and I hated the changes that were going around, around me. And I said, no, it's not great. Why do you love fall so much? She says, because when you pick up these leaves, Joe, she goes, you could do a lot with them. She says, and I don't mean just these leaves. I mean, everything in life. You can do just about anything in life you can. And she, she encouraged me to remember a quote by George Bernard Shaw. 
that says, it goes like this, I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. And she told me to remember that. She says, I want you to be thoroughly used up, Joe Sonona, when you die. And I never forgot that. And it was probably not until I graduated college, entered real estate, and then started to venture and do things and start to, you know, within real estate. But it was when I came here three years ago, almost three years ago, that I really embraced the change of our business. And that's the attraction. No more saying the word recruitment. There's no such thing as recruitment in our business anymore. It has lives. to be attraction. We're changing lives. Look at look at Dawn, who's on here on one of these streams. Um, Dawn came to me as a, as a housewife, as looking for a part-time job, and says, I want to sell real estate. And she's very influential in the community. She's a go-getter. And I said, you know, you kind of know who's going to make it and who's not. And I was like, she'll be good at this. So I said, Joe, we're gonna, I'm sending Dawn over to you. Uh, introduced them. She went and took Joe's class and learned the business. I don't know, about two years ago, I guess it was, something like that she went through. Yeah. And um, I think she did 14 houses this year, part-time. I mean, that's life-changing. That's life-changing yeah. for her. And for me, I, I kind of like I'm honored because like I'm changing her life. Like, you know, it's really uh, it's really something special. And you know, a couple people on my team that came to me as brand new agents and said, hey, go see Joe. Joe's going to teach you the business right, which is you know, you can take the classes online and, you know, self, self-taught self and all that stuff. I feel like you don't get the same that you get out of it when you go to, say, Joe's class because, you know, there's a lot more to it when someone's talking to you than just reading it off a page. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, real-world experiences. And Joe, Joe, when he teaches, he gives you examples of this is the law, and the reason they have this law is because this went down one time, and, you know, that's what he made this law. <laughs> and I know? tell a story that equates story, to that you know? because I want yeah. the story there, you know? You know, this is why we do it this way because if you don't, this is stuff that happens, and you don't get that when you're reading off a page. So uh, most of my team was trained by Joe, and um, and they're all, you know, selling houses and, and it's changing their lives. To so put a couple grand in your pocket every couple, every month, every couple months, whatever it is, you know, um, like guy Herman just put a built-in pool in his backyard. You know, I mean, that's that's fun. That's great. That's you know, great. it's uh, it's cool that you know. And when and when you think about those students that were once in that classroom, and when you look at them now, and you see how their <clears throat> their worlds have evolved from that student to now, they are teaching others. It's great. It's a great feeling to see. Like a, a Dawn, for example, and we'll use Dawn as our best example. She's evolved into this real estate agent that knows what she's doing. And Brian is there behind her to support her. And I don't think, and I'll say this um, very plain and clear, that if Dawn, and I'm sure Dawn is getting offers galore right now, right, Brian, from everybody to go and work with them. But I don't think they would have what you have brought to dawn and so that is spent a lot of hours on the phone with uh you know not only our meetings but me and dawn talk you know, almost every day about <laughs> but what you about didn't this, just bring that, dawn you, know. you you brought dawn me as your sponsor one is my sponsor you brought her seven different people that she can fall back on for support and it's you know in brokerage offices you fall back on the broker if he's there or she's there or the manager if he's there or she's there and those are the only two people that you can really rely on in a in a in a brokerage office. You know, I remember I uh, mean, you have so then much when I was at Remax, I couldn't fall on anybody because you were truly independent with a ninety three percent split, right? And that was good. That was excellent for what I had. But I felt coming to this company, and I interviewed twenty five different brokerage offices. I felt that I needed more. I needed something more. And I didn't know what that something was until I met my sponsor and I met him by accident. And yes, people did introduce me to this model, but they couldn't fully explain the model the way Juan Baronecci explained it to me. And when he explained it to me, it just all made perfect sense. That, And then I came and I said, you know what, Juan? Brian wants me to explain the model. I can't explain it the way you did. I was only a month in. But today, I'm like a superstar. I can explain it to anybody out there. And I can show them just my smile and how happy I am. And there's your attraction right there to answer your question again, Sam. Yep. <laughs> 
I said, the, the beauty of it is that there's so many people above you that want to help you because they all have a vested interest in you. Whereas I felt like at other, at the other, you know, mom and pop brokerage, which it wasn't as friendly. Everyone was kind of out for everybody. Everyone's kind of fighting amongst themselves, you know, not in a, in a rough <coughs> way, but, you know, in the EXP world, we all have a vested interest in training and teaching those below us that we brought on because if they don't succeed, we don't get anything out of that and so it builds this culture where everybody helps everybody everybody can lean on everybody it's like it's a whole different structure than a lot of people try and make it a negative i don't see any way it's negative when you got seven people above you that are willing to help you succeed because they have a vested interest in what you're doing i mean the model is genius if you really think about it how do you make how do you build your company you make everybody train everybody you make your top producers train the people they bring in and all the way down, and like, and, and it also depends on obviously what line you get in EXP. Uh, certain divisions where we're in our line that Joe's in, Juan's in. We got Ricky Caruth with us. <clears throat> um, we got so much training and so much activity that goes on daily that I mean, there's just it's it's just a fire hose of, of training uh, when you come on our line. I know other there is other branches of EXP that do similar type trainings, and there's some branches of EXP that do, don't do any trainings, and those are the people that kind of get lost and and quit EXP and go to someone else because they didn't plug into the system. They didn't plug into their uplines and, and the trainings that are available. I mean, it's literally a phone call two, three times a day, five days a week, plus all the training in the cloud. And it's all there, but a lot of people choose not to plug in. I mean, I, I've asked I have, people, you know, when, you, when was the last call you got on? Oh, I don't know. Well, there's a call. Every I day. have role play calls uh, three times a week with my team and anyone in my uh, line, in my downline. I have uh, mornings, and then I have an afternoon training call. I have a mastermind on Wednesdays. I have two training co calls with a uh, person who I sponsor, Ricky Cruz, the national trainer coach, free coach on YouTube, uh, 75,000 followers, and manages to take two days out of his week to coach agents in his downline. And now we've combined all the downlines, Brian's, mine, Juan's, Ricky's, into a, um, a whole uh, group called Evolution. And uh, we have a five o'clock call on Mondays and Wednesdays. We're giving so much value to our agents that, um, yes, other teams give value. We're giving that value to our agents. And we have a different, little different, you know, flair, but it's, something that everybody is giving to each other. And if you don't have that in your upline right now, start one, start a mastermind, start something, start a, a it's, it's like a movement. You got to yes. start a movement in order to yes. make things, you know, work, right? That's everything. That's networking in general. I mean, that's, that's, we talk about all the time. Surround yourself with successful people and learn what they did. I mean, that's our whole basis of our apex organization that we belong to when you get in a room with with that's it, yeah. powerhouses that they've they've made the mistakes they've went bankrupt they've lost the businesses and they figured out how to do it and if you can hang out with them and learn uh, you know a little bit off them that saves you a year saves you five years saves you 10 years saves you a bunch of mistakes and it's all about you know we talk about coaching in general right it's the express lane to the to to success you know all you you all the mistakes that we've made we teach those below us not to make those mistakes. So all that time and money that we've lost to, in that process, we can just share that with a simple phone call, with a simple, you know, couple weeks of coaching. And now you just save five years of your career of trying to figure it out. And um, a lot of people are just so afraid of coaching where it's like, doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, I don't want to pay for coaching. Well, you're going to pay thousands and thousands of dollars in mistakes and lost revenue by not paying a coach and not learning the mistakes and not learning the secrets to success and everyone's so resistant to it. They don't want to listen to their coach. Um, they, everyone thinks they're gonna, they know it better, and it's like, you know, like, why? Like, if this person figured it out, learn what they're doing and copy it. It's that, that simple. Like, don't try and reinvent the wheel, and so many people try and do that. Um, even on my team, it's like, you know, I tell them, all right, this is what we're gonna do, this is what we're gonna do, and then they do other stuff, and I'm like, I didn't say to do that. That doesn't work. That's why I told you not to do that. Do this instead. And then they go do that again, and I'm like, no, stop, don't do that, you know, like, <laughs> doesn't look good. People don't like sharing flyers of your face all over the, over every single mom page there is saying, you know, sell your house. 
Like it just doesn't people, work. You know? People don't learn lessons until they're ready for them, Brian. We you can't value. force a lesson on yeah. people, man. Just bring you value. Can't force bring, it. bring value, bring attraction, you know, help people, and then it comes to you naturally. You, you're when fine. the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Don't there you, you go. Old adage. Uh, they, you're fighting how many years of, of, of just traditional marketing that have been put in front of these kids and they think that's how to do it they think that putting a, your face on a bus is is going to be the right way to yeah. generate leads and that, that's just because that's what they've seen in the movies dude you just yeah. gotta let them sometimes sometimes you just gotta let them spend money on flyers and go, go figure it out you, uh, know? you know we got john Hiley in our group uh the marketing savage and mm -hmm. uh i'll give him a plug go check out the marketing savage.com so so his idea is attraction marketing I and mean, that's his whole thing is you build this energy this culture this that you know, if you don't be a plumber, you be the best plumber. You don't be a real estate agent, right. be the best real estate right. agent, and let everyone know that you're the best real estate agent. And not being cocky about it, but just be stand out in the crowd and really stand for something and represent. And people attract to you. You know, it's attraction marketing, and it's it's really a concept that that he's run with. That's how he trains it. Um, and uh, he's like I said, he's got uh, different podcasts and stuff like that. He's got a book, The Marketing Savage. All great stuff. I was listening to him this morning on his podcast and. Uh, it's really just that whole idea of don't just be a real estate agent, be the best real estate agent and do everything you can possibly do to be the best real estate agent. And if you're Les not being Brown honest, says, uh, Les Brown says birds of a feather flock together. Yep. Yep. You know, they, everyone has a different feather, you know, and you're not going to, you know, make them do anything that they don't want to do. So yep. if they're running left and you're running right, don't expect anyone to be behind you except for the people that want to run right with you, yeah. you know, and, and they're not running with you because they're trying to figure it out on themselves. And yeah, they'll learn, they'll come back to the road, you know, less traveled. You know, that's why Robert Frost wrote that book, that poem, because, um, you know, he felt that he was on this road like you are and like I am, like Sam is on where we're on the road, less traveled. And, this road has truly made a difference in our lives. Whereas people took the road, they were at the fork of the road, they made a left, and now they'll slowly come back to that point, that pivotal point where they get that, um, you know, that, that, that retrospect or actually the introspect. They're going to look at the road in a retrospective way, and then they're going to do an introspect, which they're going to look inward. And then before they get on the right road where we are and, and we'll be on the next road ahead uh, before they get on that road they'll do a lot of reflection inflection they'll be they'll be looking at themselves and saying okay maybe you know sam brian and joe were right that night when i heard them but did i really hear them or did i just hear the words of a charlie brown teacher <laughs> 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 you know yeah. um Look, it's, uh, it's something that you really can't teach. And uh, I'm not going to say you can't teach stupid, but you can't teach the work ethic. You know, it's just impossible. People have to have that, that get up and go. My team is learning. My team is learning that this was a whole year of learning. Now we want to get out on, on the gates of 2022. Um, we want to hit our goals for 2022 and we're going to hit them hard and we're going to hit them hard and it's not going to be pretty no one said success was uh all you know sunshine and rainbows but it's going to be a hard year of getting to where we want to be and when we get there you know some of us will have fallen and we'll we won't be on this team and some of us will be on the team but we'll have some scars some battle scars and that's what success is about, you know, is being in that top, you know, 1%, you know, and there's not that many people there for a reason. Yeah. It's hard, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was easy, everyone would do but it. But it's, so. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that hard that we can't call it easy, you know. It's not an easy climb. It's not that hard, but it is hard. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I, I think me and Sam have talked about this. I kind of find it easy. And I think, Joe, you kind of find it easy. I mean, but our... our you make it look easy. But You're getting the words easy. wrong. You're getting the words you wrong. It's, too. It's, Don't think it's, it's simple. Bad. It's simple, simple say, but yeah. it's not yeah. easy. Yeah. It is right. simple. I it's find just, it simple. It's processes. Yeah. It's, it's steps but, yeah. over right. and over and over. 
But it's yeah. not easy. It's not easy to stay consistent and yeah. keep giving value. And it's not easy to, you know, you might have you might have great months where you're putting nice mid five figure checks in the bank. And then you might have a month of drought. And you wonder why yeah. you're out here, but you keep doing the simple stuff over and over and over and over. Um, so I, th- I think that's that's definitely a a, a mix up. I hear a lot. It, it it isn't like easy, but it is simple. You know? Yeah, it's a simple it's, process. It's just doing, yeah. doing the steps over and over and over consistently. Again, right? Yeah, and I guess the diff- that's that's the point is that we know the steps and we just keep repeating the steps and it just mm-hmm. keeps working. Where and it gets so, better and better every time you repeat them and yeah. every time you get it right. Yeah, you know, I just took a it listing does. today. I know it's like an end of year. Boom, you know, just took a six hundred fifty thousand dollar listing today. Boom, you know, it's like, you know, why not? Let's go. <laughs> let's get it. Let's get it up. Oh, you know, my, right. my stuff, my stuff ebbs and flows depending on how busy I'm at, but I've got. Um, I've got six in escrow and I've got nothing left to sell. I'm like, nah, now I got to go manufacture listings yeah. literally by finding houses without estate owners and banging on the door and see if I can, uh, see if I can sell them for them. Like there's, I think we've got about 120 houses for sale in our, in our entire market area. Um, in so my town, we have out. like 10. Yeah. It's crazy. So, I have 53, an all time low in my area mm. that I never thought I would see that number ever. You know, usually around this time of year, it's about 100, 110, 120. Volume is down considerably, and it's uh, kind of just wondering next year. I mean, obviously, we're all good at selling, but if there's nothing to sell, um, Mm -hmm. it kind of hurts, you know. It's hard to have, you know, it's like selling a Rolex right now. If you're you're in a watch store and you're trying to sell Rolex right now, you got an empty case. You know, you better better find a new line of work because there's no Rolexes to sell right now. So same idea. Yeah, but... People will always have to buy or sell houses. I mean, they'll, they'll always have to. I, I wonder what the uh, what demographic changes we're going to see over the country over the next few years, uh, especially with migration. Um, you know, we've had a huge influx of people down to Texas here in the last couple of years, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people from all across the United States. And I know with the devaluation that we're seeing in the dollar and with the high demand driving prices down in Texas, um, there's just there's just a massive shortage of housing still. Do you all see that stuff up there? Or yeah, we have that is... in New York, and uh, I mean, we've definitely got a housing shortage going on in Long Island right now. Yeah. And it's really yeah, everywhere. We get... Upstate New York, I got agent friends. We go up uh, by Lake George a lot, and they're all seeing the same thing. Everything's getting scooped up. People are buying. I think a lot of it um, has come to the being able to the COVID factor of working remotely. Once people mm-hmm. figured out that they don't need to go to New York City for an office anymore, they said, hey, you know, or I have to go in once a week for a meeting or something like that. Yeah. Now, I'm not commuting five days to New York City. I can go out an hour or two from New York City. And so what? You know, once a week, I got to drive two hours to go to the city. The rest of the time, I'm living in the country with a big house and a big property and, you know, working so for my think, computer. So that's, I think, a big the, fact. So the, the, city's, the city's bearing the brunt of this then? People are moving well, the city's out from there? Back. I mean, city's coming I, back. I don't too. know. I mean, like, city, took a, city took a big, big hit. And, um, but now, I mean, my, my friends that are agents there are saying it, you know, it used to be like, you know, for a little bit, it was kind of like, you know, buyer's market. But now it's, for everyone I'm talking to, it's, it's coming back, you know. It's not what it was, but it's not it's not giving properties away like no, you were thinking. Not that. That's why I'm not, I'm not really worried about next year. You know, I think no matter what, the, the demand will still be there and we'll have to just find a way to fulfill it, I mean, you know. Yeah. And, I think people will always need housing. Mm-hmm. They'll always need food. They'll Good always housing. need shelter, you know? clothing, shelter, or yeah. all of the above. Um, there will be a ma- there will be a change. There will be a, a shift, and I think with that shift, we have to know how to learn to adapt to the shift. They, remember, there are agents in our field that have never experienced the down market. Everyone Oof. said they were killing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and now is the time, if any, to, to start building your inventory and, and really get out there and make those relationships happen mm-hmm. so that this way when the shift does come, which I'm predicting by the end of March, um, and I don't mean this big explosion, but I think your inventory is going to start swelling up the, the, the swelling up will come in the form of a lot of overpriced listings. That's happening you know? already. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not seeing the lines that we were seeing. We were seeing lines with 50 people on them, you know, for four hours at a shot. I don't know if you're getting that down by you. Bless you. No. Bless you. I mean, they are, they are in Austin. We don't. Okay, bless you. <laughs> Good thing I was on mute. <laughs> 
<laughs> Joe, are you getting uh, lines down in the Long Beach area on those things? Like, if the, if the house is not priced well, and I don't mean this under value yeah, of the home, game, they, you know, because in. anybody can make a line out the door if they undervalue the home. Yeah. Um, but if the price, if the house is priced well, it will sell. That's what I tell the homeowners. I go, listen, if you're planning on getting fifty, sixty thousand dollars more than what I just told you it's worth, you know, you're gonna have to call in another realtor who wants a listing. I don't want a listing, I want a saleable listing. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between what you want and what I want. Uh, you want an overpriced thing and I want something that's going to sell. And I love the people that say, oh, but Joe, I don't want to give it away. Mm -hmm. You couldn't give it away even if you tried at this price. Yeah. So I'm not going to give it away. I'm going to get you the highest and best price for your home because I firmly believe that, you know, this is how we work and this is how you should let us work. And once you sign on with us, you know, you're telling us you trust us mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't trust us yeah. you know and why they don't trust us is because again they fear the unknown so it happens not just with an agent it happens with the sellers it happens with the buyers etc yeah. etc yeah no definitely it's uh i i got some kind of good advice from uh my my friend and uh, my other mentor, Leon Sanchez, who uh, was my first broker I worked for, and he basically said, in this market and in this technology, people kind of know what houses are worth, and it seeks yeah. their own level. I mean, if it's underpriced, people are going to bid it up to what it's worth. And if it's overpriced, people aren't going to show up. If you do an open house, you don't get any offers, you're overpriced. You know, that's plain and simple. If you got a dozen or so better people through the house on an open house in a good market, and no one makes an offer, you're overpriced. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's like kind of three le three ways of price. You go underpriced and try and get the bidding war. You can go for what you think it's going to sell for. Or you can go for the needle in the haystack. Needle in the haystack sits. What you think it's going to yeah. sell for, you'll get maybe one offer at the open house. And when you're a little bit undervalued, you'll get 12 offers and there'll be a bidding war. And in this mm -hmm. market, when there's a lot of supply and demand, the bidding wars seem to, I don't know, it's not always a win because a lot of times people get buyer's remorse. They bid it up 10, 20, 30, 50,000 over asking price. And at the last minute, they, you know, ah, they change their mind. And then... The rush is gone, and now the next weekend, how come it's still for sale? And now the bidding war doesn't happen. So if you don't sell it during that first bidding war, and it lasts mm. to the next open house, a lot of times you don't get the bidding war the second time around. Then it, because people realize I like to, there's no fury anymore. Dude, I like to price them right, 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 like yep. fractionally, fractionally under uh, what they could expect to get, because it's so difficult when you've got the sellers that they want to try and hit a home run. And they they want to add thirty forty fifty thousand dollars to the price, and well, we'll see. We'll, we'll just we'll we'll put it out there high and see if somebody bites. I'm like, yeah, you don't want to it's yeah. it. You, you just you don't want to mess with it at that point. But, but they don't realize the appraiser is going to come in. Yes, gonna, he or she's going to knock the value. They don't realize that mom and pop are the first ones if they're lending the money to the <laughs> son or the daughter that they're going to knock the house. Oh, back in 1960 something, I paid this amount for my home. Why am I paying? My, why is my daughter and son paying this amount? Well, do what's worse is when the father-in-law comes on the inspection, <laughs> <laughs> and he brings a notepad yeah. and a tape measure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's gonna check everything. Yeah, it's like, what's your experience? Oh, you know, I'm an accountant. Oh, you know, how much you know about home inspections? Yeah, yeah. and it's it's so, always the wife. So it's always the wife. The mother and the father knock it before negotiation. The uh, inspection comes, the mother and father knock it. It's the mother and father. We got to get rid of the mother and fathers. <laughs> we got to make sure that they disappear for the inspections. Then the appraiser comes and they might knock the value because, you know, not every appraiser is, is pushing through these. Yeah, it's an educated these, uh, guess, loans. too, for them, right? So yeah. sometimes yeah. they guess different, you know? It's, uh, you know, it's their opinion. It's, it's opinion, only yeah. their opinion, right? Their, their factual opinion, they say. And if you get through all it's that, not. then you get to the attorney, which Sam doesn't deal with attorneys like we do. Uh, we get to the attorney, and we agree on no appraisal contingency, no inspection contingency, all this stuff that we agree on in, a, in a the course of the deal in order to get the offers accepted. The attorney goes, I'm not agreeing to that. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's but that's the attorney. You're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the attorney. Like, that's the attorney's job, though, to slow him down a bit. But like, yeah, hey, yeah. Um, you, you might want to reconsider this and actually put a... Uh, 
putting an appraisal contingency in there. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the attorney's I work job. with two, two very nice attorneys. Uh, we're going to expand our base a little bit. So we're going to have a, a Spanish speaking attorney. We're going to get creative a little bit in the new year. But I have to tell you, I got two nice attorneys that are working our clientele right now. And, and they come from a school of calm. You know, don't don't get too outrageous. To, you know, just calm, you know, yep, yep. whereas some attorneys, they'll come from a school of, you know, the philosophy is, you know, let's uh, negotiate for as much as we can after the engineer goes in there. And this is not the market to do that. Yep. I, I see their point, but that's not the market to do that, yep. especially when people are coming in with multiple bids and and you're going to play now, you know, you're going to roll the dice, you know, just to see if you could get away with another $10,000 off the price because your attorney told you that this was the best strategy. What about your realtor? Yeah, there's, an offer, there's an offer two thousand dollars behind you. Yeah, if you, you want to roll the dice on ten thousand, boom, they go right to the next offer. Sorry, you missed yeah. it. See ya. You know, it's uh, the attorneys, the, the old school attorneys that used to be away. Oh yeah, we're gonna get ten grand back on the inspection, but that one is multiple offers. Like, nope, we'll just go to the next offer. Sorry, thanks. See you later. And uh, and Sam, you don't have that problem because you go right to contract in your state, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you yeah. can't play those games, you know, but. You can actually I mean, get the there's, inspection done, right? We contract, and then we go to escrow, and then the inspections happen, and, and generally there's a – it's generally a 10-day inspection clause that, that you'll ask for, and, and, and they'll grant. And then if you have to make any renegotiations after the inspection, it's all done with an uh, amendment. Like, it's it's all just settled on the contract. There's they We create an amendment for the contract, and all the parties agree to whatever – uh, additional repairs or additional credits or any, any of that kind of stuff uh, it's all written down and then added to the contract and then they move forward or um, you know they have the right to terminate after the inspection if if let's say it needs twenty thousand dollars worth of work and you made me an offer as is and you know there's the right to terminate if I decide that I don't want to fix the work and it seems to work very well um, we we have attorneys involved right at closing um, that review the title and stuff and just do, do all the uh, the stamping of stuff. But um, generally, we're, we're, we're left to our own devices, provided that we in absolutely no way actually practice law. You know, we're not allowed to give legal advice or write the contracts. We're just right. allowed, we're, we can fill in the blank bits, essentially, <clears throat> you know. And stuff like, stuff like getting the gutter fixed and stuff like painting a wall. I mean, it's, it's so common. You, you, you know, it's, it's nothing to worry about. I think we just lost our feed on, uh, on my Facebook. Something just happened. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we're, well time anyway here, we're so. at time anyway, so it's probably a good time to yeah, stop. Yeah, um, just, just gentlemen, died. thank you so much. This was a real was great. Uh, treat for me to be on your podcast. And, um, and obviously, um, uh, you know, I think I got the message out there on all fronts, the EXP front, the teaching front. Um, volunteerism, you know, is a good thing if you can get your associations to change with the times as well. Education is important. If you can get the uh, Department of State in your state or your commission uh, in, in their state, they call it a commission. If you can get the, those people to change the curriculum a little bit,